Sometimes it is literally scary to think how simple things affect our glucose metabolism. And the goal here isn't to scare you, it's to be able to explain something so that we can take this information and do something with it. Because insulin resistance is a very real thing. And there was a study that was published in the Journal of Sleep Research that found that just one night of sleeping at four and a half hours compared to seven hours ended up increasing insulin resistance 16%. Just one night of really bad sleep increased insulin resistance the next day 16%. Now, you've probably got what you needed out of this video and you wanna click off of it, but the reality is this is a larger explanation and when we understand the big picture, there's things we can put in place to improve this whole situation and maybe even prevent it from happening a little bit more. So let's dive in. Today's video is sponsored by Seed. If you're worried about your gut microbiome, you're trying to make some changes, but ultimately, if you're trying to add carbohydrates back into your diet after doing low carb for a long time, very important you take care of your microbiome. So that link down below saves you 25% off of Seed's Daily Symbiotic, which has a prebiotic and a probiotic in one capsule. So a capsule inside of a capsule. Super interesting technology. Very, very cool to check out. So they also fund a lot of microbiome research. So they put their money where their mouth is. A lot of the proceeds go back into research because we're trying to understand what these little microbes in our gut do and how important they are. So anyhow, it makes a big difference, made a big difference for me. I don't usually recommend probiotics because a lot of them are garbage, but this one's definitely worth a shot. So that link down below is in the top line of the description for seed. Now, when we look at the relationship between our blood sugar and sleep, it's a little bit of a two-way street, okay? If you are already starting to develop a little bit of insulin resistance or decreased insulin sensitivity, and you don't necessarily realize it, it can impact your sleep because there's some epidemiological things that you can look at with correlation. For example, a lot of times people that have higher levels of insulin resistance will also maybe have sleep apnea, and that's affecting their sleep. But another common thing is that peripheral neuropathy. If your blood sugar levels are high, and they're chronically high, that can affect the nerves, which can make you kind of feel restless at night, giving you this restless leg syndrome, right? That can definitely impact your sleep, and you don't even realize it has to do with higher levels of glucose or insulin resistance. The other thing is, is just having high levels of blood sugar at night in general can make you feel really hot, they can make you feel irritable, it can make you feel like frustrated, like when you're trying to sleep but you're frustrated. And then low levels of glucose can end up triggering these nightmares, this clammy feeling, these cold sweats. And then in addition to that, nocturia. Like when you have higher levels of glucose in your bloodstream at night, it's going to make your kidneys try to filter that glucose out and make you have to pee. So you end up having to pee really bad one, two, three times per night and that definitely impacts your sleep. But then it kind of begs the question again, like which came first, the chicken or the egg? I mentioned those things because if you feel like you have those potential signs, you may wanna go test your glucose. But now I wanna jump into how sleep actually affects our insulin resistance overall. So there was a study that was published in the journal PLOS1 and then another meta-analysis that was also published in PLOS1. The first study found that poor sleep was an independent associator with type two diabetes. What that means is that independent of all other things, sleeping poorly was somewhat of a determining factor for developing type two diabetes. But then when you look at the big meta-analysis that took a look at over 447,000 people, it gets really alarming. They took a look at people that were getting less than six hours of sleep compared to seven hours of sleep. The difference was huge. The people that got less than six hours of sleep had a 30% increased risk of developing insulin resistance or type two diabetes. That is huge. And that's just comparing less than six hours compared to seven. If we just get ourselves up to seven, we get ourselves to a much better spot. Then there was a study that was published in the journal Lancet. This one was interesting because they exposed people to different sleep patterns. They took a group and they had them go through six nights of restricting sleep down to four hours. So six progressive nights of four hours. Then they had them move into seven nights of spending 12 hours in bed. They didn't necessarily get 12 full hours of sleep, but they were just saying 12 hours of sleep slash rest. Okay, so it was really trying to compare the difference of lot much sleep and a lot of sleep. Throughout this period, they had both groups consume three high carbohydrate meals, okay, identical. Each group ate the same high carbohydrate meal. 
And then on the fifth day of each of these tests, they gave them an intravenous glucose tolerance test. Well, guess what they found? The group that was sleep deprived had a 40% reduction in glucose clearance. That means that they were less efficient, 40% less efficient at clearing glucose out of the bloodstream. And they had a 30% less acute insulin response, meaning their immediate response to carbohydrates in terms of the insulin spike was 30% delayed it was messed up so what ends up happening is you end up having this late response which allows glucose to get higher and then the pancreas has to secrete more and more insulin to try to accommodate and deal with that glucose this was just after a few nights and i know this sounds all very negative and very scary but i promise i'm going to give you some things that you can implement to improve your sleep as well but we also have to understand the mechanisms behind why the potential lack of sleep is doing this a lot of it has to do with our sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. When we're sleep deprived, we are not getting that parasympathetic relaxation activity of the nervous system that we would normally get. When we sleep, we normally get a parasympathetic nervous system tone, which means that we have less overall metabolic function happening, we have lower blood pressure, lower blood sugar, everything sort of chills out. But if you're not sleeping good, you have a higher sympathetic tone, which means metabolic stuff goes into overdrive. Glucose goes higher, blood pressure increases, all these metabolic demands increase. Okay, what does this do to your body overall? Well, this overall stress response is A, going to increase glucose to begin with, because the increase in norepinephrine, noradrenaline, all these things are gonna increase glucose because it's your fight or flight response. So glucose stays elevated, which means that insulin has to be secreted to deal with that glucose that's elevated. But you also have what is called an alpha adrenergic vasoconstriction. This simply means that when you are having that stress response, you get some vasoconstriction into the muscle tissue. The vasoconstriction limits the amount of blood that can get into the tissue. When you limit the amount of blood that can get into the tissue, you limit the amount of glucose that can go into the glucose sink of your muscle. We drain glucose essentially into your muscle. If you have less blood flow getting into those peripheral nooks and crannies, you have less glucose being disposed of so it stays in the bloodstream for longer and this can happen in a postprandial fashion so you have a postprandial vasoconstriction so normally you would have a vasodilation you consume food you have an increase in blood flow to deliver nutrients but if you're stressed out the vasoconstriction is sort of superseding that making it so that the glucose from a meal doesn't get delivered, it stays elevated. What's interesting is there was a study that was published in the journal Metabolism that took a look at norepinephrine levels, and they did what is called a cold presser test, where they would stick someone's hand in really cold water and measure the norepinephrine response. Well, they did an 18-year follow-up, and they determined, based upon this data, that those that had a higher norepinephrine spike at the time of the cold immersion were at higher risk of developing insulin resistance 18 years later. They had a higher HOMA IR scores. So that is an interesting thing showing that if you were more responsive to stress and you had a larger grandiose stress response, you were more likely to develop insulin resistance. But I wanna end this all with some pragmatic things and also some good news. Because there was a study that was published in the journal Sleep that found that just increasing sleep to six and a half hours during the week and about seven and a half hours on the weekends. So on average, they increase sleep for about an, by about an hour. They did this for 40 days. Just doing this after 40 days significantly improved glucose levels, fasting glucose levels, and insulin resistance, improved their insulin sensitivity. So very, very good news that baby steps make a huge difference. So if you can manage to get yourself to six and a half hours during the week and seven and a half-ish hours on the weekends, that's tremendous. Some of the things that you can do, two ways to look at it. You can try to improve your sleep, which sometimes is just a stressful thing to do to begin with. You get stressed out about improving sleep and it makes you sleep worse. Or you can deal with the side effects of sleep from the stress. One of the things that I would recommend people do is no particular brand association here whatsoever. Invest in a small red light, one of those red light therapy devices, even just a small one. And when you wake up in the morning, use the red light so you're establishing better circadian cues. Better yet, if you don't have a red light, 
and you like to go outside, go outside and look at the sun when it's low on the horizon because you're getting those same similar wavelengths of red light. What that can do is it can help your circadian clock genes establish a better pattern. Okay, another thing that you can do is use some tart cherry juice before bed. I'm not a big fan of taking melatonin supplements because I feel like you're disrupting a feedback loop that shouldn't be disrupted too much. But tart cherry juice contains a small amount of natural melatonin, but it also contains tryptophan and does some other things that help encourage sleep. And really promising data there. So just a few milliliters, 20, 30 milliliters of tart cherry juice a few hours before bed can really help you sleep in a number of different ways. So definitely pay attention to something like that. Another thing that you can start doing is utilizing a sauna two or three days per week. What this does is it increases what's called intracranial pressure. So it helps what's called the glymphatic system flush out, I hate saying it like this, but nasty particles and potential toxins out of the brain which is a normal response. We have the glymphatic system to flush metabolic waste, but by increasing the intracranial pressure with a high heat sauna a couple days per week, you expedite the removal of those waste products, which can actually help you sleep a little bit better. So I definitely recommend that. Another thing is not eating after dark. It plays a very, very powerful role and something that I highly recommend everyone pay attention to. Eat with the sun and pay attention to that and try to eat larger meals in the morning and then wean off the food as you go throughout the day. So as always, keep it locked in here on my channel. I'll see you tomorrow.